Okay, so we're ready. For our final week with George. Oh. Oh. <laughs> You won't miss him that much. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I, I'm just observing. <laughs> okay, so topic this week, death and dying and reincarnation in the Tibetan tradition, including but not exclusive to the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. Take it away. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So... Uh, what I've tried to do this year and last year is talk about different aspects of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, Tibetan Buddhism is a very complex tradition, I have said, and hopefully after these two years you see that it is complex. And this complexity is well captured, I think, by what's called the three turning of the wheel. The first turning of the wheel is the turning of the Four Noble Truths, basic Buddhist teaching. And as I said this year, I'm not going to talk about that because I assume everybody is quite familiar with basic Buddhist ideas. But these basic Buddhist ideas, such as the Four Noble Truths, such as the Refuge, such as the centrality of the Sangha, all these uh, uh, important Buddhist ideas are at the basis uh, uh, of Tibetan Buddhism. Okay? Second turning of the wheel, uh, the perfection of wisdom sutra, with its teaching on emptiness. And last year we talked about, I talked about emptiness at length, and that's the second turning of the wheel. Now this year what I mostly talked about uh, is really the third turning of the wheel. And the third turning of the wheel, instead of uh, taking Buddhist practice from the point of view of an ordinary person who tried to undo the illusion of ordinary life, like ordinarily we see life, uh, we see our life and uh, aggregate as stable, permanent, uh, happy, pure self, and so on. That's the ordinary way of seeing uh, things. Uh, basic Buddhism and the perfection of wisdom teach that this, w this way of uh, looking at life, uh, looking at ourselves, is mistaken and teach us how to free ourselves from this illusion and so free ourselves from the klesha. This is essentially the first and the second uh, turning of the wheel. The third turning of the wheel uh, teaches, uh, is based on the first two, but goes further and seeks to introduce uh, what you could call the enlightened perspective how reality is seen from the point of view of the enlightened person. And that's in many different sutras. Uh, for example, you find it in the Avatamsaka Sutra, where uh, there, are, there is a, a set of very rich metaphor, like the Tower of Airochana, which is given as a way to talk about uh, how reality is seen from the enlightened perspective. And then you have also the Tathagata Garbha Sutra, the so-called Buddha nature teaching, which also seek to introduce uh, the practitioner to an enlightened state of mind. And that is this uh, perspective, which is uh, very much at the basis of tantric practice. So what I have insisted in tantric practice uh, in trying to explain what tantric practice is, the idea that tantric practice is essentially based on the introduction and immersion into the uh, pure awareness, into pristine awareness, the mind of clear light, how we want to uh, call it, and 
uh, it is this way of practicing which is at the basis of Tantra and which is very much part of the three, the third turning of the wheel. So these three turnings of the wheel, in, in a way, gives you a fairly good idea of what are the different strata uh, that make Tibetan Buddhism. And this year, we really focused on this third turning of the wheel and talked about this teaching about uh, pristine awareness and so on. And we have done it from two perspectives. One is that of the new tantra, which seeks to use embodiment to try to get a more profound immersion into this pure awareness. And last time I talked about Dzogchen and Mahamudra, which is a way to get to this uh, pristine awareness, this already enlightened aspect of our consciousness, without having to deal with this, without having to go through this very difficult exercise of controlling the wind energies and simply looking at consciousness in and through ordinary conceptualization to find uh, uh, this enlightened state of mind. And that's the, what I talked about last time mostly, which is the cutting through stage of Dzogchen. Okay? Okay, so today what we are going to talk is mostly a particular aspect of Tibetan Buddhism which is to do with uh, death, reincarnation. And at the end of the uh, talk, if I have time, I also want to explain a little bit the structure of Tibetan Buddhism in terms of different schools, because this is something which is really different between Tibetan Buddhism and other forms of Buddhism, particularly if you think about Theravada. So, uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, right? Everybody has heard about the Tibetan Book of the Dead? made really famous in the West by, the translation, not so bad, by Evans Wentz, a commentary well, pretty much of the world by Jung, but what do you expect? And then uh, adopted by uh, Timothy Leary uh, for the use of practitioners of uh, LSD and other hallucinogen substances. So. Uh, I assume everybody has heard about that. I don't think it's so popular nowadays because when I ask my students whether they have heard about the Tibetan Book of the Dead, I get like this blank stare. Like, what are you talking about, dude? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a blank stare anyway? <laughs> no, 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 that's a different one. No. So. I find that people have heard of it, but yeah. I've never met anyone that's read it. Yeah. So, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is a translation of a book called Bardo Te Drol. Te? Te, T-H, Bardo Te Drol, which means liberation upon hearing in the Bardo. What is the Bardo? The Bado is the intermediary state that is exist or assumed to exist between one life and the next one. Now, this notion is not a Tibetan notion, it's an Indian idea which comes from the Abhidharma. There are various versions of the Abhidharma and in some versions reincarnation or next life rather let's call it uh, next life is supposed to happen right after death right in some other versions of the abhidharma like for example the sarvastivada abhidharma and the yogacara abhidharma there is a intermediary state which links this life with the next one that's called in tibetan the bardo which just means intermediary state literally Okay? Remember, if you have a question which is directly relevant to what I'm talking about, don't hesitate to ask it. If it's not directly relevant, then maybe leave it for the end. Okay? <coughs> so, the bardo is not a particularly Tibetan notion. It's a notion which exists in several Buddhist 
uh, tradition, including in several Abhidharma. What is uh, specifically Tibetan is the idea that the bardo offers a special opportunity for people to practice uh, Dharma. And that's an idea which I think is fairly unique to Tibetan, or at least uh, among the Buddhists who still exist nowadays, because actually what I will argue is that this idea that Bardo is a special offer, special opportunity to practice, is an idea which just derives plainly from the practice of Tantra. And by Tantra here, I always talk about the highest level of, anu of Tantra, what's called Anuttara Yoga Tantra in the new tradition, and what's called Maha Yoga, Anu Yoga, and Ati Yoga in the old Nyingma tradition. Is this a question? Uh, is that practiced here in Thailand? What? I said Tibetan. Yeah, but I've seen chanting for two weeks or a month uh, uh, on a body before they cremated it. So what's going on with that? Uh, you, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Okay. The, yeah. It's kind of implicit in Thai Buddhism but it doesn't come from a scriptural basis, although there is, in fact, a Pali scriptural basis to support intermediary state. But the Abhidharma, which was 300 years later, uh, rejected it. So original Pali Buddhism did have a bardo, but Theravada, which came later, didn't. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's also important to differentiate uh, what, how shall I call it? Little and great tradition or the practice, popular practices from the practice of elite uh, yogis or practitioners. And uh, I will say a few more words about that. Now, the, te the book itself, the Bardo Tundral, is not a particularly important book in Tibetan Buddhism, contrary to what you would think if you uh, l look just uh, notice its fan. <laughs> it is just one text that deals with uh, practice at death and in, in the intermediary state. There are hundreds of texts who deal like that. All the, tra the different traditions have their own particular versions of Bardo practice, which actually look pretty much pretty similar with some differences. But in general, you, this is not just, there is this book, but this book just represents a genre of literature rather than one book. In fact, I was a monk for 15 years, a uh, Geluk monk for 15 years, and I never encountered the Tibetan Book of the Dead because Tibetan Book of the Dead, in the sense of his Bado Tundral, is a Nyingma text. It's a terma, and uh, it's a text which is specific to the Nyingma school. And then the Geluk have their own text about that, and the Kagyu, and the Sakya, and so on. So this <laughs> book by itself is not particularly important, but it represents a genre of literature which is quite important, which is to deal with death and the intermediary state from the tantric point of view. Yes? Is, is that one, the name is the Nida culture. The what? Nida culture. Nyingma. Nyingma? No, no, no the, uh, the, this book. It's, uh, it's part... It's part of a, of a terma from the 14th century by Karma Limpa. So I don't know what's uh, the name of the, the term, the cycle terma. But this is just one text which has acquired great fame because it happened to be picked up by Evans Wentz and translated. But it's just one example of a genre of literature which all schools uh, of Tibetan Buddhism sharing. There are some enigma particularity to this text, but in general, uh, the picture of the of the dying process in the intermediary state is relatively similar across a different school, and this, uh, uh, there is a good reason for that, which is this is a 
Terma. And if you remember Terma via this revealed text, which in fact served for, to, for, to, for the Nyingma tradition to incorporate teachings coming from the new tantra, from the newly translated tantra in the 11th, 12th, and 13th century. And so rather than adopt this other teaching, these teachings were kind of reinterpreted in, for the Nyingma school through the vehicle of the Terma, which are these buried texts. Uh, supposedly buried by various people, but mostly Padmasambhava, some Vimalakya, Vimalamitra, and so on, and uh, uh, rediscovered by various people starting in the 11th century and going on up to nowadays. There are still people finding termas. Please come in. <laughs> okay? So, <laughs> This uh, text, this genre of literature, uh, <laughs> deal with the process of dying and uh, the intermediary state. Now, they are used when, in... When you say process of dying, that goes on past the, when the body dies. Yeah, I'm going to explain. Oh. Yeah. Now, what I want to uh, also uh, indicate is that this kind of text uh, serves several purposes. There is a ritual purpose, uh, which is when people are dying or are dead, uh, you hire people who recite one uh, Bardo Tundral if you hire Nyingma, other text if you hire people from another tradition. But this is a kind of ritual use of this text. So this goes together with what you were saying. Now, uh, the idea is that when you read this text, the person who is going through the process of dying might suddenly hear it and be able to become aware of what's going on. If you ask actual lamas who are like practitioners, they will tell you that the chances are pretty small. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, in Buddhism, you have to do the job yourself. Nobody can do it for you. That's the good thing and the bad thing at the same time. <laughs> and uh, if you ask real practitioner, that's what they are going to tell you. But it's important that the laity gets its, get rituals because, uh, as you probably all know, religion is certainly one of the main goals of religion is to allow people to come to terms with death. Uh, people are probably quite mistaken is to think that religion is about survival to death because many religions, there is no survival uh, after death. For example, in Judaism, for many, many centuries, there was no afterlife. So it's not the case that religion is about this kind of false hope about uh, living after death. But it is certainly in, uh, I think, on all the traditions that we know of, including the, the primordial tradition, it is about, uh, one important aspect is about coping with death. And so it's obvious that this kind of texts are going to be used uh, by monks and by teachers, lamas, and so on, uh, to uh, provide the kind of uh, uh, ritual which uh, help people uh, to deal with death, right? That's really important. But there is obviously, so this is one aspect. It's also the case that, uh, to pursue that line of inquiry, that the Bardo Tundral represents a kind of interesting uh, fusion between uh, Buddhist ideas and shamanistic practices. Uh, shamans often... Uh, uh, go to the other world, they have this kind of ecstatic practices in which they go find the dead, talk to the dead, maybe recover the soul and so on. And so the Bardo Tendral seems to be a kind of uh, using that kind of template uh, to introduce Buddhist ideas and practice. So from a, a popular for, for point of view, 
this is an important kind of genre of literature because it pertains to uh, what is in fact a Buddhist specialty, right? Death. Uh, in Japan, you know, uh, people were asking, what are you doing? And I was saying, I, I'm dealing with Buddhism, and they were looking, looking completely puzzled. And the reason is that in Japan, Buddhism is largely about death ritual, and they thought, what are you doing with death ritual? And yeah, that's, Buddhism is very much in charge of death ritual in many cultures. And, but for, in Tibet, obviously, it's very important. Uh, and the Bardo literature, let's call it like this, plays a very important role in that. Okay, now there is another aspect, which is what I want to talk about, which is this kind of literature from the point of view of the advanced practitioners who undergo the process of dying. Uh, and that's a very important aspect because it's a very important aspect of tantric practice in general. Okay, so <laughs> why is death particularly important in tantra? Well, because it offers an extraordinary uh, opportunity to remain absorbed into the what we've called primordial awareness, pure consciousness, Buddha nature, and so on. Because at the time of death, at the time of death, uh, as I will talk about in greater detail, the body dissolves and the mind, the, layer, the grosser layer of the mind is all, and at the end of the dying process, what is left out? This more, uh, most primitive level of awareness, this kind of pure uh, awareness that I have talked about for now uh, two, two weeks. This is the third week, and that occurs naturally for everybody. But most people, because they're not trained yogis, uh, are unable to do anything with it because they go through it completely unconsciously and therefore they are sh pushed out into the intermediary state and the next uh, life. But for a tantric practitioner, this is a great opportunity because it is hard actually to uh, encounter a naturally occurring occasion in which all the wind energy have died and there is nothing left but the most subtle level of uh, mind or awareness and wind energy. And that maybe occurs for a very brief instant in, in August, but it's very hard to stabilize it and to be immersed in it. Uh, so, but at, at death, it happens naturally. And so this is why death is considered a great opportunity for advanced tantric practitioner. And in fact, advanced tantric practitioner uh, think of death as a very positive event. Now, this is nothing uh, strange for Buddhists because in fact, uh, Buddhists in general think of death in some way, death of the enlightened person, as a positive effect, not ordinary death, but death of the enlightened person as a very positive event, right? When we celebrate the Parinirvana of the Buddha, right? And so this is nothing surprising, but in Tantra, this is... Sorry, George. Oh, that's okay. In Tantra, this is a very important element. So... <laughs> A lot of tantric practice is understood as a preparation to this event. Uh, this event, the dissolution of the body and, and the different uh, level of consciousness, is what is being mimicked, for example, in the development stage, which is deity yoga, the first stage, if you've been following you understand that the first stage of tantric practice is deity yoga in which you visualize yourself as a deity. When you do some of this visualization, you actually visualize yourself as going through the process in order to train yourself, to prepare yourself to go through the actual process of dying. 
And then when you are, if you're fortunate and, and uh, enough to ever get to the completion stage, in the completion stage, you actually experience some of the stages leading to death. So if you are uh, an accomplished uh, tantric practitioner having reached the, the, the completion stage, you actually have gone through several of these stages. And so when they occur naturally, you are able to immerse yourself and to use them for the sake of uh, liberation or spiritual advancement. So that's why uh, dying is a particularly important in Tantra, and the Bardo Tantra is just one example of how death is, uh, uh, the preparation to uh, the dying process is a central element of tantric practice. Okay? Now, uh, so let's talk about a little bit about the dying process because there are some interesting stuff here. Uh, <laughs> first, obviously, Tibetans have the same kind of general recommendation. Tibetan teachers have the same kind of recommendations that other Buddhist teachers have, meaning like uh, be calm, be surrounded by calm people, supportive people, no crying, no holding to people, just a calm atmosphere. Also bring some uh, images of the Buddha, some statues, and so on. So to create uh, a, 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 a positive atmosphere during this uh, real ordeal. Now, this is very important in Buddhism because uh, what prepares, what is going to bring uh, next life is karma. Now, often the karma which brings next life is described as a kind of dominant karma that uh, the person has created. For example, if the person is a killer, well, good chances then during the dying process, it is that karma that, can, that is going to bring about the next life. But, <laughs> And there is a big but. Uh, <laughs> or, on the contrary, before I go in the but, for example, if you've been really a kind person during this life, it's likely that it is this kind of karma which is going to impulse next life. But... <laughs> <laughs> is that the same but? Or a but? <laughs> it's the same but. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there are accidents. Oh, no. There are accidents. Meaning, if you're, if you're put in a bad situation, uh, your attitude, your emotions, your anger can bring forth another karma, which was not supposed to uh, create impulse next life, but that we actually will because you're dying in, a, in an attitude of anger or attachment or whatever. So it's very important that the last moment uh, be the last moments, uh, be, you be in a good attitude, uh, and you might even be able to kind of not completely cheat karma, but postpone bad karma uh, by being in a good attitude. Even if you are a schmuck like some people are in this world, where no names will be given, <laughs> I let you fill the, the blank. Uh, <laughs> But if you are in a good mental attitude at time of death, you might be able, at least that's the teaching of Buddhist uh, uh, masters, you might be able to bring forth a good karma and therefore uh, have a positive next life. So the time of death is very important and delicate in any Buddhist culture. That's why in Buddhist cultures, uh, what's called uh, untimely death is supposed to be extremely negative, and this is the case in, every, in several Buddhist cultures, maybe every, I don't know, but the case in Thailand, where untimely death is considered extremely dangerous. Is and every death untimely? <laughs> no, no, on the contrary. <laughs> no, t untimely death is when uh, the, the bus step over you, right? right. Yeah. 
And in Thailand, you think, well, this is very dangerous because it's going to become a, a ghost, a P, and so on. And so in all, in all Buddhist cultures I'm familiar with, there is this idea that uh, untimely death is really dangerous because what we should uh, hope for is a timely death when we die of uh, slowly, of old age, or some kind of disease which does not incapacitate us completely and which allows us to remain as conscious and uh, as possible and uh, in an as good disposition as possible. So these are general recommendations, Buddhist recommendations about the dying process, uh, which I think uh, are common to many different Buddhist traditions. Now let's deal a little bit more with the dying process from a tantric point of view. And talk a little bit about what happens or how the text, rather, uh, describe what happens uh, during the dying process. The idea is that in the dying process, the body ceases, uh, ceases uh, to be able to support uh, the stream of consciousness. And that is described as happening gradually through uh, the five elements. So, earth, water, fire, wind, and then space or consciousness. I, usually I would have said space, but in the text that I assigned for today, actually it's talking about consciousness. This is a, a commentary on the Bardo Tendral cycle by uh, Selenatso Grandrop. Okay, so <laughs> the body is going to cease its abilities to support consciousness gradually. And in that process, you're going to have internal and external signs that manifest this process. So first, what's going to cease this is the earth element, meaning the body's uh, solidity, the body ability to maintain itself is going to uh, collapse. That's the external sign. The internal sign is said to be the appearance of a mirage, something like a mirage which is a sign that now water element has become prominent, right? And when water element is going to collapse, meaning uh, the body will become much drier, the uh, internal sign is supposed to be sparkles, so oh, internal sign of Earth is a mirage, right? Yeah, no, yes, mirage. After this goes, then you get the mirage. Mirage. So, no, then you get the smoke. When water collapses, you get the smoke, and after that you get the sparkles. So on the Earth, the physical representation is the collapse of the body, right? Yeah. Sparkles is after fire. Yeah. Sounds good. Sparkles. Yeah. So collapse of the water element, the body gets drier. Collapse of the fire element, the body gets gradually cold, starting from the extremities. Next to it, please. Okay. Uh, it is next to it, right? No, the external sign. Okay, this is external. I don't know how you. These are internal signs. Yeah, these are the, no. These are the elements. Yes. These are the internal signs, and then the external sign is. The body ceases to be able to support itself. The body becomes dry. Right. The body starts to lose its heat. Yeah. And then the body lose breath. The external signs, mirage, smoke, sparkles, and when fire collapses, you get... Uh, you start to get a, a kind of empty space. Empty. Yeah. Empty with, a, uh, I think it's... 
sometimes it's quite empty with a white luminescence. And then after you have that, you have the red luminescence, and then you have the dark luminescence, and then the death process. But we'll not go into that. So when the earth element ceases, the body ceases its ability to maintain itself. Uh, when the water element ceases, the body becomes dry, loses its fluid, and then it loses its heat, starting from the extremities, right? And then, at some point, it loses breath, right? There is no more breathing. It doesn't lose the space. That's when it's said that the text, wind collapses into space or into consciousness. When <laughs> you, the person is there, the person is externally dead in the sense that the person is not breathing anymore. From a tantric point of view, the person is not dead. And it is said that even at this stage, the person can come back to life at some time. It does happen. People stop breathing, and then um, sometimes they are revived, right? That's pretty rare, but that does happen. So the process, what is really interesting from my point of view, is that the process uh, of dying is actually quite complex, uh, whereas most people assume that, you know, either you're dead or not. Well, it's not quite that simple, because the process of dying takes... In the good case, obviously, if you're flattened by the, uh, the bus, the local bus on, on Ekamai, uh, that's not going to happen uh, very nicely. And you're going to be just, the whole process is going to be collapsed in a fraction of a second. But if, you, if one is lucky enough to die uh, of a natural death, of a timely death, uh, what is going to happen is this complex process at which point you are going to stop uh, breathing. When you are there, you are entering, there are actual several stages, but that doesn't matter. You are entering a, a state of mind which is very close or which is this kind of pure awareness that we have talked about at length for the last two weeks. Now, if you're an ordinary person, you're just going to go through that, and this is going to be just uh, confusing, and you're going to just lose consciousness, and you are just not going to be able to do very much. If you are an accomplished tantric yogi, you can actually uh, follow the process and control in the sense of being with the process, being able not control in the sense of stopping the process, but being able to be with the process uh, uh, and therefore be able to immerse yourself into this pure consciousness in a uh, way which is going to be liberative and uh, going to make you progress very quickly on the path. This, so this is, so you realize this is really important, right? And in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, when, uh, when people, meditators die, uh, it is not rare to see meditators remaining at that stage for days or up to two weeks. Sorry, what stage? This stage. Isn't that the dead stage? No, it's not. It's close to death. Close to death. Yeah. And normally, you just propel into the next life. But if you are a yogi who is able to control his wind and is able to remain with the dying process, you're able to remain here for several days, one week, even two weeks. The person is look like completely dead. But there is apparently a little bit of heat at the heart center, uh, no breath, and the, per the body does not decompose uh, 
during that time. At some point, you're going to see probably some blood coming out of uh, the nose. That's a sign that the person has finally died. At that point, the body will decompose extremely quickly and need to be cremated very quickly. But this has been observed medically by people, for example, in Baksa, when the Tibetan escaped from Tibet. And there were a couple of people who, uh, there were one person in particular who was able to remain for two weeks. Now, this is long, but several days is actually fairly common for uh, a Tibetan uh, Teach accomplished Tibetan teachers in the dying process. This is not rare at all. Yeah. Uh, I, I think one of the last things to go is a very tiny pulse. Okay. Yeah. Could be. I. I pulse one. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I don't know. There must be something. Uh, you can read it from the neck. Uh, the what deaf. Uh, how you decide death is not an easy topic. Yeah. Even clinically, it's not. No, that's what I mean. Clinically, it's not an easy topic because, for example, uh, if you were to have an EEG in the in the uh, make an EEG, probably you would not see anything because maybe if there is an activity, it might be at a deeper level than the cortical level. So actually, to decide whether how that works. Uh, physiologically is not an easy question. And obviously, it's very difficult to uh, examine that because uh, yogis, when they die, are not that interesting in being guinea pigs for uh, uh, doctors, right? They have their own death to think about that's traumatic enough. And so, uh, uh, obviously, it's very hard to figure out exactly what's going on at the physiological level, but clearly there are these, from a tantric point of view, there are these different stages, and so even when the person stops to breathe, the person might not be dead. Yes? Uh, this uh, explanation, this process, mm -hmm. we were just going to ask, mm -hmm. so this sounds like the, uh, the symptoms uh, when we practice in the Mahamudra, yes. the light meditation. Yes, yes. So that meditation simulate. That's right. Practicing. Yes. Just for the people who couldn't hear, he's saying that this process sounds very much like some of the uh, Mahamudra. But tantric meditation. meditation. Yes. It's very much because Tantra is supposed, both stages of completion, the development and completions are ways to prepare yourself to go through that during the, at the time of death. So absolutely. This, when you uh, generate yourself as a deity, you often dissolve yourself following this, uh, these stages. And when you are in the completion stage, you actually can experience this stage, it's, it's not quite deaf consciousness because otherwise you you would there would be no return. But you're pretty, you're very close to that, and this is what you're able to to experience through the completion stage. Oh, I wanted to also ask, like, a, so are other forms of meditation uh, good to do while while dying? For example, vipassana. Well, we'll not oh, talk no, about sorry. that. Now, remember only what is relevant. To the topic because we could go in all kinds of different directions. Okay, any question about this dying process? Because I think it's quite interesting and it's certainly uh, thought. Sorry, yes, please. Um, would discussion of dream yoga or. Oh, I have that's yet to come. <laughs> when, when people talk about seeing a light at the end of the tunnel or something like that, it's just, just very similar to what you're talking about? Well, you could say maybe it start to be here. In here, one of the stages here is, a, is like a dark sky with a white luminescence. Mm -hmm. That's the metaphor which is given. Then there is another stage. And then so you could say, well, maybe these people were at that stage and then they got back. Because in the Tibetan tradition, it said that when you are here, you can go back. I mean, if your karma allows. 
uh, you, you can go back. Once you're past that, then you are getting close to the consciousness at the time of death. Yeah? Um, I've also read that um, sometimes when people go through that process, highly enlightened people, yes. that there are also some external physical signs like rainbows in the sky. Is that but true? Is that part of this? That's, the, that's what is in the culture, yes. <laughs> so yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, the, the saying, saved by the bell, was about people who had died and been buried, oh, yeah. and they were yeah, yeah. string yeah. tied to their hand yes. to a little bell, and somebody would wait outside the grave to see if the bell rang. So it shows that people can be pretty dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they, are, they are here. I mean, it's like being like yes. highly pregnant or something. I mean, you think that it's either dead or not. No, but it's not like that, exactly. Which obviously, to me, raised question about, for example, organ donation and all yeah. kind of things yeah. from a Buddhist perspective. This is a, actually, a, I find it a really difficult question. You don't want to wake up with no heart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any more question? So, now, if uh, you don't come back and you go through that, uh, you're going to die. And when you die, that's when the bardo, the intermediary state, begins. That, in that intermediary, that intermediary state is uh, uh, the link between the life we had just ended and the next life, and it's a process which leads you to your next life described as uh, uh, being undergone through the power of the karma that is going to lead you to your next life. <laughs> During this process, uh, the person is said to experience many different visions, some of them peaceful, many of them terrifying, and these are just the uh, reflection of the karma. That's how it's described. So this is something that people under that the stream of consciousness undergo. In that state, uh, you have a stream of consciousness, and with that stream of consciousness, you have the wind energy, and that wind energy creates a kind of uh, astral body or dream body, something like that. And that's what you have in the intermediary state. I have to say that's very contrary to my own readings. Uh, that's actually, believe me, I, <laughs> I've, I've studied that. Stuff. Have you been there? Uh, no, I've not been there. Okay. So I don't know. Uh, nobody has been there, but uh, I'm just <laughs> reporting... I'm just reporting what texts are, are, are saying. I'll be quiet. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> now, uh, that state of uh, the bardo offers another great opportunity to become enlightened. And the reason is that in that state, uh, it's relatively easy to transform reality because everything is of the nature of the mind. In the ordinary state, we are in this body, and this body kind of constrains how we see the world. Uh, it makes us see the world in particular ways, and that's very hard to overcome. In fact, if you remember, what I said is that in Tantra, you can be enlightened in one lifetime, but not in a single body, because there is no possibility of full enlightenment. By full enlightenment, I mean Buddhahood, in this kind of ordinary body. But in the Bardo, you don't have this kind of ordinary body. All what you have, the stream of consciousness and the wind energy that support this stream of consciousness. Yes? Is this like the first bardo? Are there numbers to them? Or are you just talking generally? I'm talking generally. Okay. 
but there are other certain... Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I'm going to give a very simplified version of it to make understandable what is at stake here. Now, if you read the Bardo Tundral, it's going to tell you that you're going to see all these deities, wrathful deity, peaceful deities. And so some people think, oh, that's what we're going to see after death. And then obviously you think, well, if you're Christian, what are you going to see? If you're Hindu, what are you going to see? And then if you're atheist, what are you going to see? Dawkins or what? (laughs) (laughs) That's not what uh, is going on here. (laughs) The Bado Tundral is not describing what is happening to the person. It's describing how the person should transform what has happened to him or her through the tantric meditation that he or she has practiced during his or her lifetime. That is, there are going to be frightful and peaceful experiences happening which are just manifestation of uh, the karma, but the person who is uh, a, 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 a strong tantric practitioner is going to be able to transform the peaceful experience into vision of the deity, the mandala, and so on, and the frightening experience into vision of the wrathful deities. So what the Bado Tandral is teaching is not what happens naturally, but how you should go through the intermediary state if you are an advanced tantric practitioner. Okay? That's important because there is a lot of nonsense written about this text. And it's, this text does not describe what is happening. It describes how you should undergo these experiences by visualizing the uh, uh, wrathful or peaceful deities. And you, if, you, if you Google uh, Bardo peaceful deity, Bardo wrathful deities, you will see all the different uh, set of deities that uh, various texts teach, but particularly <laughs> that one. It's amazing the amount of information on the internet. Yes, when I started this thing 40 something years ago, there was absolutely very little about Tibetan Buddhism. Now it's, the internet is full of it, but not everything is right, obviously. Full of all the secret Tibetan teachings. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, so what is important in the bardo is to become aware that you are in the bardo. Because otherwise you will be pushed by the winds of karma towards your next life. So the, what is important is to be, to be awake, to be realizing that you are in the bardo. And that's difficult. That's why people read the bardo tendril with the hope that the dead will listen and will hear what you're saying and therefore realize that uh, he or she is in the bardo. That's why people read it, not the person who's dying is read it. That's why people read it. Yeah, you have monks or lamas who come to your room and read it in front of the dead body. (laughs) Now, uh, obviously this is a hope and maybe it happens sometime, uh, I don't know. Obviously, to be sure that it happens, you need to prepare yourself. And that's where dream yoga could be very useful. Dream yoga is basically a form of lucid dreaming in which you become aware that you are dreaming. And you are also in dream yoga, not in lucid dreaming, or in lucid dreaming too. But in dream yoga, you're able to transform your appearances, right? And that's really... It's like the bardo. You can see the resemblance of dream to the bardo because in dream, you know, you're free to go to see uh, deities, to go to see the Buddha, to go to see, to go to all kind of places because there is not no uh, inertia from the body, right? And so in dream, it's once you become aware that you're dreaming, which is difficult for most people, some people arrive relatively easily, but for most people this is quite difficult. Once you become aware, then you can start to practice 
uh, dream yoga, which is a way to transform appearance uh, into whatever uh, you want them to be, right? So the preparation to uh, the bardo state is uh, the one of the preparation is a dream yoga, because if you're able to <laughs> be lucid in your dreams, then you have good chances of being able to be lucid in the bardo. And then you can use all the tantric visualization that you have done to transform your appearances. And because there is nothing which resists this transformation, that transformation happens much more easily. Any question? Yes, please. Do you know uh, much about uh, awareness and deep sleep? No. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, uh, there are meditations, there are, I mean, you, you are, in, in the tantric practice, uh, you are supposed to be able to enter dream, uh, deep sleep in a, a kind of controlled way. So you are able to use deep sleep as a way to uh, immerse yourself into this pristine awareness in a way which is not just the ordinary way in which you're just completely unconscious. That's part of the tantric training. But I really don't know a whole lot about that. Uh, but it is supposed to be an ability that you develop as you are able to enter uh, more and more into this uh, state of pristine awareness. That's what the Tantra is, in a way, all about, right? Now, if you practice just Dzogchen and Mahamudra, it's going to be hard to do that, because in Dzogchen and Mahamudra, you see you're in touch with pristine awareness, but through the ordinary mental state, right? And so uh, you, it's harder to get fully immersed into this pristine awareness. That's why most uh, people who do advanced Mahamudra and Dzogchen practice always combine Dzogchen Mahamudra with ordinary Tantra so as to be able to get into this deep state of deep states of absorption into pristine awareness. Okay? If you don't have monks to come and recite the Tibet, one of the Tibetan books of the dead while you're dying, can you just play the cassette? <laughs> sure, why not? Why not? Yeah, yeah, why not? One of the techniques also, uh, there are several techniques to become aware of dreaming, is to have one person uh, near stay at your bedside and tell you you're dreaming, you're dreaming, you're dreaming, obviously in a Small, kind of low voice, uh, <laughs> presumably a nice voice, otherwise it's like, oh, shut up. Yes. Okay, so that's what this Bardo literature is about, is this whole training, uh, which is supposed to prepare you to the to the death process and to the intermediary state, so as to use these occasions, which are going to happen necessarily, as opportunities to transform this occasion into opportunity to advance on the path. And that's what Tantra is, is in a way all about, the transmutation of uh, ordinary hu aspects of uh, uh, humanity into uh, forms of enlightenment. Any question about that? Then I have a few more minutes to talk about. Uh, that's what I wanted to say about uh, the teaching of the Bardo. You were going to say there were some stages to the Bardo. Oh, in the Nyingma tradition, you have uh, teachings which basically 
takes you through all the stages in terms of different forms of bardo. That's more Nyingma specialty. Okay. So there are differences between the different schools, but they are relatively so minor. Uh, and the overall picture is very, very similar. So basically one big state, it's not like a set number of bardos that you change? Oh, uh, that's... Depend on the book? That's, yeah, the, I, I forgot the detail, but uh, the bardo is supposed to have 49 days, but that's also totally individual, can happen very quickly, can take longer, so uh, they're all kind of different circumstances. What isn't important is to understand that this discussion about uh, wrathful deity and peaceful deity are not a way to describe what is naturally happened, but just what you can do in that stage to advance along the path. That's what is really the most important message here. Yes? So when you say advance along the path, mm -hmm. what, what are the possible results? of being able to practice this when you were in the body. Okay. Uh, <laughs> in the uh, Tibetan tradition, uh, there are discussions about whether, how is it possible to really get to the, to get fully immersed in the mind of clear light, pure awareness, while being in this body. Okay? So, in, in, for several uh, traditions, the preferred mode is to prepare yourself, and then when you die, you're actually able to reach the mind of clear light. Okay? At that point, when you get into the bardo, you automatically obtain the illusory body. And then you have the mind, the dharmakaya of the Buddha, and the uh, embodiment, and you're pretty close to enlightenment. So this is... Illusory. I talked about that two weeks ago. Yep. Or it's also called the rainbow body. There are several terms. Okay. No, so no, if no, you no. have clear light with rainbow body, illusory body, then you're pretty close to enlightenment, to full enlightenment. And that's what Tantra seeks to bring about. Creation, the immersion into the, full immersion into the mind of clear light, and when you get out of it, the creation of a new form of embodiment. That's what Tantra aims to do. And so that process is the ideal state to do it, because in death process, contrary to other human occasion, you're naturally plunged into this more subtle level of consciousness. And so if you're able to do it consciously, and then to get awake, uh, arise from that into the bardo consciously, then you're pretty close to full enlightenment. Yeah? So let's just say that we've taken the Bodhisattva vow. The what? Bodhisattva vows, yes. Because it's Mahayana. Yes. So, so you're not going to go ahead and become enlightened, even if you can, because you want to go back and help no. others, right? No. This is a total misunderstanding of the Bodhisattva vows. The bodhisattva vows are not about... Sometimes the bodhisattva vows are described as postponing enlightenment. It, that's, the, these descriptions do exist, but they don't reflect actually what the bodhisattva vows are about. The bodhisattva vows are about taking the commitment of becoming fully enlightened Buddha for the sake of helping others. That's what the bodhisattva vows are about. So if you are a bodhisattva, you want to become enlightened as fast as possible, because once you have the wisdom of the Buddha and the embodiment of the Buddha, you are in the best, you have the best tools to help others. So the idea that the bodhisattva postpone enlightenment is a misunderstanding. What is meant by that is the bodhisattva postpone enlightenment for himself or herself 
to attain enlightenment for both self and others, which is the state of Buddhahood. So what is being postponed is the nirvana of the arhat, which the bodhisattva could enter very uh, quickly. The bodhisattva postponed that in order to be able to reach perfection, not just for oneself, but for others as well. That's what uh, is meant when it said the Bodhisattva postponed enlightenment. He postponed enlightenment of the Arhat, not enlightenment of the Buddha, because that's what he is seeking. Right? Do you understand? So the enlightenment of the Arhat then is the concept of being gone, 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 right? Well, the enlightenment of the Arhat is the perfection of, of wisdom. It's like, the, it's like the Buddha mind, but without the embodiment. Yeah, without the embodiment. Therefore, you, you kind of, uh, yeah, you have problem to help others because in order to help others, you need to, an embodiment. And therefore, uh, the, the Mahayana and the Tantra are on one, one voice on that, which is the goal, is not the Nirvana of the Arhat, but the Nirvana of the Buddha, which is the mind of the Buddha and the embodiment of the Buddha. Okay? So when you read uh, uh, that the Bodhisattva has postponed enlightenment, you should understand, has postponed enlightenment of the Arhat because he, was, he wants or she wants a higher form of enlightenment. That's a Mayana idea. So this is a really important point because there is a lot of misunderstanding. You often uh, read that the Bodhisattva pos uh, postponed enlightenment, and then there is a contradiction because the Bodhisattva is also su supposed to take the vows of becoming enlightened for the help of, for helping sentient beings. So which one is it? Does he want to be enlightened or not being enlightened? Well, there is no contradiction because actually what is being postponed is not enlightenment per se, it's enlightenment of the Arhat, and what is being sought is the enlightenment of the Buddha, which is both the perfection for oneself, the Dharmakaya, and for others, the Rupakaya, the uh, enlightened embodiment. Let's continue. Right. So, so, then, so then you've got the Bardo, you reach this point where you are pretty close. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and then, let's say, there is the possibility of rebirth again. Uh, at that point, no. You, 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 at that point, no. You, 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 you're on your way to full enlightenment. There is no question of rebirth, uh, at least ordinary rebirth. Now, people who are able to develop some level of practice but who are not quite at that stage, then they might be able to uh, kind of choose their rebirth or control their birth and so on. And that's a theory behind the idea of the tulku, the reincarnated lama. Supposedly it's a person who is not necessarily fully enlightened, contrary to what the name indicates, Nirmanakaya, but that's not what it means. It means just that this person is advanced enough in tantric practice so that he or she is able to undergo the bardo and have a certain amount of control on where she wants uh, or he wants to go. Okay, so that's a lower level. But once you are at the mind of clear, at the stage of clear light, and the illusory body, uh, you know. So, so where does the illusory body come into it then, to follow on with that? So what do you mean? Let's say you're at the very high level and you wave your hands as if you're gone again. But you've got an illusory body now. Yes. <laughs> So is this then functioning on some very higher level uh, according to tantric practice? I don't know. I mean, basically all the texts I have seen talk about up to the point of obtaining the illusory body. At that point, it's like, you, we don't need to worry about you. you, you you're quite on. You're doing well. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, please don't forget us. Yeah. Uh, but uh, having yeah. Having an illusory body seems to have some... Well, you are able to manifest yourself in countless form to help sentient beings. That's what's supposed to be, right? But the illusory body is a stage before this full ability. It's kind of... But, but you, it's used for... Yes, that, for communication. Yes. 
So that's why it's good to develop the illusory body. That's why it's very important, because if you're just uh, an enlightened... Even if you're fully enlightened, there's still like a bodhisattvic act in a sense of... Well, that's what, yeah, the Buddha uh, okay, so does. Yeah. 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 So you can hang out in the illusory body for a while helping people? Uh, I would, <laughs> wouldn't be able to say, but presumably, uh, why not, right? <laughs> I, I think at that point, you don't really need my help. Are, are you going to come on any way to telling us a bit about how they find reincarnation? So? Yeah, that's a little bit uh, what I'm... Yeah, to. talk about school, but I want to finish this uh, topic. I have a question. I have a feeling there's a kind of a missing link. So... You die, you go into consciousness, you get all these experiences, yeah. you transform them into yes. powerful and the, the nice days. Yeah. And then how does that then translate in the next step, getting uh, the, the Dharmakaya? The, uh, the well, it, it, uh, it depends at which level of tantric practice you are, so that's quite complicated, right? If you are at a high level and you are able to get to the stage of clear light at the time of death, Naturally, after, when you get into the body, you get the illusory body. If you're not there, then you kind of have to continue practice, tantric practice, and basically you're going to be reborn. Okay? So it's only, illusory body is only for the people who are basically free from rebirth and then go and then come back in to help others. Yes. Uh, the, the duration that we are in the bundle, what I heard, is the 49. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, and, uh, that's just a number, right? But is it true? No, it's <laughs> just a number. No. What? No, it's just a number. The, the teacher I've talked to said, you know, it can be all kind of duration. It can be seven days. Seven, seven is 14. So it can be seven days, it can be 49 days, it can be any uh, duration. But is it, it can be beyond 49 days? Yes, that's what teachers have told me. I have no idea. But okay. teachers okay. have okay. told me, yes. Yeah. Can uh, the other thing, what I heard is, uh, most likely people will be reborn by the 21st days. Is, is it true? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. <laughs> what if these, these monks come and recite the Tibetan Book of the Dead just after you've died, but you don't speak Tibetan? Uh, Does it still work? I have no idea. <laughs> because you, uh, you are in the bardo, and yeah. therefore in the bardo, you're not in this life anymore, right? So you can understand Tibetan. <laughs> so I have no idea. I have no idea because now what is what is interesting obviously is when people talk about rebirth, uh, that's a real problem because at the time of death everything breaks apart, right? And what is left, what is left is just this most primitive form of awareness. That's the only thing left, if there is anything left, and that. Consciousness has no language, has no conceptualization, no ability to recognize anything. So presumably everything disappears. So I have no idea. But you know, my, some of my teachers used to be pretty skeptical about the degree to which you can help people. Because I heard that the rebirth appears as a cool blue light. Like in between all the madness of the deities and things. And yeah, the vet, the dirt. Appears and you yeah. go into that because it feels stable. Yeah, and then if you are a man, you see a woman. If you're going to be reborn as a man, you see a woman. And if you are a woman, you see a man and you're attracted and then you get reborn. But obviously, what happens if you're gay, right? <laughs> 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 if you're going to be reborn a man, you, you enter into the man's right nostril, and if you're going to be reborn female, you enter into the yeah, nostril. The, yes. These are all kind of, you know, descriptions. Yeah. Yes? Very quick. Are you familiar with the POA procedure? I'm not familiar, but I know what... If you haven't seen it or... No. Is it is a physical... Yes. You, in the top of the crown. In, in the poa, 
No, it's not a hole. In the poa, you, which is, means transference of consciousness, uh, you are given a special empowerment and a special practice in which you visualize your consciousness being ejected from your head. Apparently, when you do this well, a sign of success is going to be a little bit of blood on the top of your head. Obviously, that doesn't mean there is a hole, because you would be in real deep trouble if there was a real hole in your, in your uh, head, right? But it is supposedly a sign of success, and so this is a different kind of practice uh, in which you uh, can forcefully eject your stream of consciousness from your body due to special circumstances. And then that's also used as a ritual form in which the Lama practices the poa, the transference on other people, but I have no idea to which ex extent this is positive, this is uh, successful or not. It's always this double use of all these kind of uh, practices, one is for the really advanced practitioner and the other is for uh, helping people to deal with different difficult circumstances. And that's in, uh, also another reason why Tantra was so successful, because in a way Tantra is really difficult to do and required very long training and is quite complicated, but obviously it also gives the practitioner ability to help by people, ordinary people, through rituals and so on. Yes? In your time as a monk and as a translator in the Tibetan circuits, Dharamsala, did you have any interesting experiences with people dying or people no. going to help? <laughs> no, I'm totally, I'm totally like, please don't get me there. <laughs> yes. You know, I'm like, no, 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 okay, that, yes, let's go to the cafe and, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, no. Not your uh, What's that? Not no, and uh, obviously when a per one of my teachers died, but uh, I wasn't very close to him, and when it happened, actually quite suddenly, he went... He stayed about three days in uh, meditation, but obviously all the doors were completely locked and uh, nobody had any access to that person until he was dead. I have a question. How do we... Directly relevant, yes, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so uh, I think, gosh, um, I'm just wondering, how do people know about this process of death anyway? Who's coming back to talk about it? Well, uh, this is... Uh, probably partly built on report from lamas undergoing the process of death, these first stages. Obviously, the external signs are always observable, right? But the experiences, it's probably a kind of uh, lamas telling what is going on, right? Maybe. Obviously, after that, then it's just... Uh, build on the theory of Tantra, right? That's what is the underpinning of the whole Bardo literature, is Tantra, the theory and practice of Tantra. Okay, that's, we can carry on the discussion afterwards, but we're going to wrap up for uh, today. George put a huge amount of effort into setting up these talks and making sure he knew what he was uh, uh, going to be talking about providing all the links and the documents and everything. I mean, he's really put in a lot of effort, so I'd like to thank you. And we will get more because next year we're having later Tibetan Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the course. I'll put the